Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I'm excited to share the information with you in this video. And I know I'm always excited to share information with you, but today's a bit different because today we're going to be looking at how to set up a development environment for creating Z80 assembly language programs, specifically for the ZX Spectrum Next computer. For me, the most difficult part of the process in learning how to develop games for the ZX Spectrum Next specifically has been setting up a development environment. Now with the ZX Spin environment, for example, it's very easy to install. We All we have to do is download a zip file from the internet, unzip it, double click on the program icon, and we're ready to go. We're ready to assemble and debug and emulate all in one package. But unfortunately, there is no such package available for the ZX Spectrum Next computer. So for me, it's been quite challenging to configure a development environment for creating Z80 assembly language programs for the ZX Spectrum Next specifically, but of course that's my goal. But I have finally come up with a method of setting up a development environment that seems to work and there are a lot of parts to it to set up this environment, but if you're wanting to set up an environment on your computer for developing Z80 assembly language programs, specifically for the ZX Spectrum Next computer, then if you have the same hardware that I'm using, and I'm going to be using uh, just a regular Windows computer, and of course you can set up an environment on uh, a Linux computer or an Apple computer, of course, but today I'm going to be looking at setting up a development environment on my Windows computer. So if you want to follow along with me, then by the end of today's video, you're going to be able to, or you should be able to, set up a development environment that will let you create Z80 assembly language programs specifically for the ZX Spectrum Next computer. Now, as you probably know, if you've been following along with my videos up until this point, the point of this video series is not actually intended to be a tutorial series in explaining how to do things in my videos, although it seems to have uh, developed that way and it turned out that I pretty much am explaining how to do things in my videos, but I don't want to try and come across as being an expert in the techniques that I'm sharing with you guys because I'm certainly not an expert, obviously. I'm just excited to share with you any techniques that I come across that work for me that I feel would be useful in my development journey in learning how to program games and develop games for the ZX Spectrum next. Now, the techniques we've been looking at up until this point so far have been applicable to the regular Sinclair Spectrum computers. For example, the introductory Z80 assembly language programming we've done and the machine code programming and the basic programming that we've done so far. But now it's really time to start focusing our efforts, or my efforts at least, on really looking at developing programs for the ZX Spectrum Next computer because of these incredible features and capabilities that it has. So in today's video, we're going to be setting up a development environment and today's video actually is designed to be a tutorial. I'm not just going to be sharing with you kind of my impressions of things and my general opinions. I'm going to be setting up this video as a specific tutorial where we're going to be going step by step uh, through all the different steps in this process of setting up a development environment because like I said, there is no uh, one-stop shop where you can just download an integrated development environment for doing this. So you have to actually go out and find all these pieces and download them and install them and configure them. And it's for me, it's been a challenging process. And I want to share with you uh, the method that I've come up with that I think will be at least a good starting point for being able to develop assembly language programs for the ZX Spectrum Next. Now, the solution that I've come up with is not um, the total final solution that you have to uh, be satisfied with. This is actually more of a starting point, but it's a starting point that actually works for what I needed to do. And I just want to let you know that you can also improve on this solution and you maybe already have if you're already a computer programmer and you have more knowledge than I do, you probably already have a better solution than what I'm going to be showing you today. But what I'm going to be showing you today is a solution that will allow us to create Z80 assembly language programs on a Windows computer and we'll actually be able to execute them inside the CSpec emulator that we took a look at in uh, one or two previous videos. Now I'll give you a warning right from the beginning that this is going to be a long video and I'm sure you're already aware of that if you've looked at the uh, timestamp on the uh, thumbnail for this video, you know it's going to be a long one. So I don't know how long it's going to be just yet, but the reason it's going to be long is because 
there's lots of information to cover. And as always, I go through things step by step, quite slowly, explaining things as best I can for beginners, because I really want this series to be applicable for beginners and accessible for beginners who really don't have much knowledge about how to do the stuff that I'm covering. So I may go into more detail than necessary, and you might already be familiar with this information, but I'm going to go through it step by step in as much detail as I think is necessary, especially for beginners. And also there's some other information that I just want to discuss and share with you as we go along. And so I know it's going to be a long video. Now, if you're not really particularly interested in listening to me talk or watching me talk for the next hour, hour and a half, however long it's going to take, you're welcome to stop this video now and just go down and take a look at the description that I'm going to put below this video, where I will include all the steps that I'm going to be covering in today's video. So I'll include a point form of all the different steps that I'll be looking at. So if you want to just uh, read the steps and kind of just cut to the chase right now without listening to me talk for a long time, you can just go down and take a look at the video description if you like, and I'll put all the points that we're going to be covering in today's video down there as well. So there are quite a few steps that we're going to be looking at today. There are several different pieces that we all have to kind of fit together to make them all work together, but we're going to be taking them step by step. So by the time we're finished, if you follow these steps exactly the way I'm doing it, then I would expect that you should be able to have your development environment set up on your computer exactly the same way that I have mine set up as well. Now, if you're interested in actually following my journey and learning to make Z80 assembly language programs and games for the uh, ZX Spectrum Next computer. And remember, this journey that I'm documenting is about the total development process, or it's intended to be about the entire development process, not merely learning how to program, but also for developing games, which, as you know, uh, entails several different uh, aspects, including game design, uh, flowcharting the game, and setting up the program, and coding the program, doing some graphics design, sound effects, music composition, packaging design. So there are a lot of different elements involved in game development, obviously, and I plan to cover those different elements along my journey at some point. And today we're going to be focusing on, of course, setting up the development environment because I think we're at the point now where it's very important that we start looking specifically, at least for myself, at the ZX Spectrum next and start being able to really get an understanding of its capabilities and start focusing my efforts towards taking advantage of the capabilities of the ZX Spectrum Next specifically. And although this is a series for beginners, and I don't expect that you will have very much knowledge of computers or programming in being able to follow these videos, I don't know how many of these videos obviously you've watched so far, and everyone has different levels of knowledge and experience, but I just want to kind of make it clear that, in my opinion, in order to be able to do any kind of programming, uh, such as what I'm planning to do for making Z80 assembly language games and programs, uh, there are at least some basic knowledge that we all need. For example, being very familiar with binary and hexadecimal and basic, um, well, not, not the basic programming language, although that helps, but uh, basic computer architecture for 8-bit microcomputers. So if you're not completely comfortable with those topics of binary, hexadecimal, and 8-bit computer architecture, then you might want to go back and take a look at the videos that I've made on those subjects because it's absolutely crucial to be very familiar with those topics in order to be able to develop games using Z80 assembly language, in my opinion. So if that all sounds good to you and you're ready to get started and setting up a development environment on your computer, then follow along with me and we'll get started. What I'm going to do first is show you the checklist that we're going to be going through that I made up. And here it is right here. So we're going to be going through this step by step, one at a time. So I'm assuming that you don't have anything set up on your computer yet. And obviously I've got everything already set up on my computer, but I'm going to go through it again, step by step. So the only difference would be that when I'm going through this process, it might ask me if I want to overwrite some files that already exist, for example, because it's already installed. Whereas on your computer, they may not be already installed. So just keep that in mind. And the other thing I should mention is I'm going to be showing you the exact locations and folder names and file names that I use 
for setting up my environment. And of course you can use whatever folder names and file names you like, but you might want to try just following along with me exactly just to have a starting point to get it working on your system. First, it depends of course on your experience level and you might know more than I do, but this is the way that I have been able to set up my development environment and make it work. And the last thing I want to let you know is that when we're going through this, I'm installing it, like I said, on a Windows computer and I'm going to be installing it on the C drive. So if you're not using the C drive on your computer, maybe you're using the drive that's labeled L or M or whatever it might happen to be labeled, then you just need to replace the C where I'm showing you the C drive. You replace that with the letter of whatever drive you happen to be using on your computer. So the first thing I want to look at here is this link right here, which is where I started learning how to install this development environment. So before we get started, let me just explain a bit about what we're going to be doing and what goal we want to accomplish. Like I said, there are many different parts to this development environment and we're going to take it step by step and make sure we do things exactly the way we need to in order to at least get them working initially. And like I said, you can build on this development environment if you want and you have the knowledge and the skills. And for example, when I first started to set up a development environment to accomplish this and be able to have an environment where I could develop assembly language programs for Z80, for the ZX Spectrum Next computer, I initially tried setting it up using the Visual Studio Code Editor and it has a lot of features that you can install and configure and get it working to do a lot of stuff for you automatically but I just was not able to figure it out. I don't have that level of skill set yet in order to be able to do all those complicated, well for me, complicated configurations. So I went back to the beginning and I took all the knowledge that I've gained up until this point and I went back to the Spec Next website and I started following the instructions on that site. And we're going to be going through those instructions, um, sort of my version of those instructions, with a few modifications that I've made to make it even easier and more functional uh, for us to use, I think. And so I'll just explain to you the different steps that I went through, but I want you to be aware that if you uh, want to start this process for yourself, I've based it on a starting point on the Spec Next website, which is this link right here at the top of my screen, https specnext.dev slash tutorials slash creating a Z80 assembly development environment on Windows. And I'll put that link obviously in the uh, video description down below as well. So if we click on this, let's just take a quick look at the instructions on this website, which was my starting point. And I know we also took a look at, in previous videos, installing the C-Spec emulator on our computer. And we also took a look at installing the Boreal Basic development environment on our computer, which is the next build development environment, which allows us to create programs in Boreal Basic, which get compiled into machine code. But also that Boreal environment allows us to use Z80 assembly language programs in the middle of our Boreal Basic programs. So I don't know if you've watched those videos or not, but you don't need to be familiar with anything in those videos. Uh, this video we're doing today is a completely standalone video. So you may already have one or both of those environments set up on your computer. You might already have the C-Spec emulator set up on your computer. But like I said, I'm going to be starting this video from scratch, assuming that you have nothing set up on your computer. And I'm going to start right from the very beginning. And so we're going to start from zero. And by the time we're done, we should have a development environment that lets us actually create programs and execute them semi-automatically in the C-Spec emulator. And so here, if we take a look at the screen here, this is the website on the Spec Next uh, website, which is the specnext.dev section, which explains how to install a development environment on a Windows system. And so I basically went through this instruction list here and I just modified it a little bit to make it, like I said, a bit more functional uh, for me. And the main difference that I did in changing this one is the way that we execute the programs in the C-Spec emulator. And I'll explain more about that later on when we get to that point. But if you're interested, you can go to this website and follow these instructions and you can see a kind of a written documentation 
of what my starting point was and it might explain some things that I might forget to explain or it might explain them a little differently or a little better or have some other information that might be of use to you. So that was my starting point and now I'm going to go back to my checklist here and we're going to get started actually installing this development environment on our computer. So let's take a look at what our first step is. So here, and I'm just going to put little check boxes beside these ones so we can actually check them off as we go along. And you can see there's quite a few steps on my screen here. So there are several steps to this process, which is probably why I had so much difficulty setting it up uh, initially. So the way I initially wanted to set up this environment is by using the VS Code or Visual Studio Code editor and configuring all the options and files that I needed in order to make it do what I wanted it to do. And I wasn't able to get that working, so I've gone back and followed this configuration instruction set and modified it a little bit. And this seems to work for me, so it's a good starting point for me. And I'll just offer it to you guys in case it's a good starting point for you as well. So the first thing I did was create a folder structure, or not create, create, create a folder structure on my computer. And as I said, I'm installing this development environment on my C drive of my computer. So obviously that's the hard drive inside your computer. Mine is labeled C. If yours is not labeled C, then just change the letter to whatever your drive label is. And here is a look at the different folders that I set up on my computer. So you can see here, and I'll just open my uh, Explorer here, there. So these are the folders that I want to set up initially. So on my C drive, I set up a folder called Next Dev, and you can set it up whatever name you like, but I use the name Next Dev. And so I'll just show you where that is. So right here on my C drive, I've got a folder called Next Dev right here. So I first created a folder called Next Dev on my C drive. So if you want to follow along with me, you can go ahead and create a folder called Next Dev on your C drive. And I'm not going to go through explaining how to create folders. I think you probably know that much already or you wouldn't be uh, trying to program in Z80 assembly language. So I'm going to assume you know at least that much. So this is the folder structure that I created. And here's my next dev folder right here. And you can just ignore all the other folders that I've got on my C drive. So I'll explain to you uh, just about the ones that we need to specifically install this development environment. So here, the first thing I have is my next dev folder created. And then you can see here under my next dev folder, I created another folder called SD card, which is, I'll just open my next dev folder here. And here we have my folder called SD card. And you can see there's another folder here called project one. That's also under the next dev folder. And again, here I have my folder called project one. So if you want, you can go ahead and create these two folders yourself. Uh, one folder called SD card and another folder called project one. Now, one thing I should mention at this point is that I haven't really played around with this uh, development environment yet to be able to really understand how to reconfigure it for different projects. So obviously if you're working on multiple projects and different games that you're creating at the same time, you might want different folders for those different projects, obviously. So this whole development environment that I'm setting up today, I know it works for uh, one project. So I'm just assuming that this is going to be used just to work on one individual project. So obviously you're going to need to modify this uh, configuration and the folder structures and so forth if you want to be able to work with multiple projects at the same time. But this development environment I'm showing today is at least going to work for one project at a time. And that project I've labeled this folder here called project one. So now let's see what other folders we need to create. So here you can see underneath my project one folder, I have four other folders, one called bin, one called SRC for source files, one called data, and one called etc. These are the instructions that are on the website. And so I just copied those instructions and created these folders in case I need them. And some of them we will need, uh, but uh, a couple of them we won't be using right off the bat, but it doesn't hurt to go ahead and create them, which is what I did. So I'll just go ahead and open up my project one folder right here. And here you can see I've got these four other folders created, a folder called bin, which stands for binary. So binary files 
uh, will go in there. It says here, there's a note over here. You can see it says the bin folder is for tools. So I don't have any tools that I've installed yet, but you can read on the website uh, what they intended these folders to do. And I just copied their instructions. So I've created a folder called bin, which apparently will be for tools. And I've created another folder called SRC for Z80 source code. And this one we will be using because when we create our assembly language programs, that is the source code. So our Z80 assembly language uh, programs are going to live in this SRC folder, which is right here. And we'll be taking a look at that later. So let's take a look at these final two folders I created. One is called data and one is called ETC for etc. So here's my data folder here and here's my ETC folder. So again, if you want to follow along, you can go ahead and create these four folders underneath the project one folder. And there we've completed our first step. So yay, our first step is complete and we're already on our way. The, what do they say? The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step and we've just completed our first step. And this journey won't <laughs> be a thousand miles long, hopefully, but at least we're on our way and we've completed our first step. And so none of these steps are really difficult. And also I just want to let you know that I believe if you follow these steps step by step, it should work exactly on your system, assuming you're installing it on a Windows system with the same drive letter and the same folder names and all that, exactly the way that I'm doing it. I'm not uh, installing it in a way that's going to kind of leave you hanging and trying to figure out what changes you need to make for your system. Because like I said, really the only change you should need to make is the drive letter. If your drive letter is not C, um, and if you're using a Windows computer and your drive letter is C, then you should be able to follow along exactly what I'm doing and I would expect it to work. But let's keep going and we'll continue on with our next step here, which is right here. Download image file and save the zip file to the SD card folder. So what is the image file? Well, let's go to my notes here, which is right here, which shows a link to spectrumnext.online cspect. And so I'll go ahead and open that up, which is right here. And we took a look at this when we installed the cspect uh, emulator in a previous video, but we're going to be repeating some steps here that I've already covered in previous videos, but that's okay. All you need to do is watch this one video. So this is where we're going to be downloading the image file. And if you're not already familiar with what that is, we're going to be using the CSpect emulator in this development environment, uh, because like I mentioned before, the ZX spin emulator that I've been using up until this point in my videos doesn't emulate the ZX Spectrum Next computer and we need to emulate the ZX Spectrum Next computer specifically and at this point in time the best emulator to do that is the CSpect emulator. So we're going to need to use the CSpect emulator in our development and the CSpect emulator needs to know how to emulate the ZX Spectrum Next computer specifically. So in order for it to be able to do that we need to give it an image file which is on this website here, spectrumnext.online forward slash cspec, which is in the instructions that we just looked at. And if you scroll down here to the section called current distro images, you can see there's all different sizes of images. And the image is really the folder structures and the files that come loaded on the actual ZX Spectrum Next computer. So we need to download this image so that the cspec emulator can use it to emulate a Spectrum Next computer. And so there's all different sizes of images here we can choose from. And I'm just going to choose this one, which is the two gigabyte image, which means I guess it can be used with a two gigabyte SD card and two gigabytes is way more than we're going to need for our development. So I'm going to download this file here, next distribution, two GB SD card image. And so if I click on that and download it, then it gets downloaded down here as a zip file. And I'll go back to my instructions now. And what does it say? It says download image file and save the zip file to the SD card folder. And the SD card folder is up here in our next dev folder. So remember we just created that and it's right here, the SD card folder. When you download that zip file, then you should put it into this SD card folder, which I've done right here. You can see my zip file, cspect-next-2gigabyte.zip. So there's our next step completed. Download image file and save the zip file to the SD card folder. There we go, step number two, done. What's the next step? 
copy the image file to C slash SD card. And we'll go back here to my notes. And this is the image file that I just mentioned, cspec-next-2gb.img. So let's go back to our folder. And right here we have our zip file. And we need to extract the files within this zip file. And after we extract them, we're going to be moving those files. So it doesn't really matter where you extract them to. So I've already extracted them, as you can see. But if I just uh, double click on this zip file, it'll show me what files are contained within the zip file, which are these three files right here. cspect-next-2gb.img, and then these two files, ennextzxrom, and then ennextmmc.rom. So go ahead and click Extract All up here, and extract those files somewhere on your computer where you can either copy and paste them or move them later. So go ahead and extract those files now. And I've already extracted those files and moved them where they need to be. So let's see where they need to be. Once you have these files extracted, then you should end up with these three files somewhere on your computer, wherever you chose to extract them. It doesn't matter where you extract them to because like I said, we've got to move them anyway. So let's go back to my instructions here. And it says copy the image file to the SD card folder. So like I said, the image file is this one called cspec-next-2gb.img. So you take that file and you move it to the SD card folder. And if I take a look at my SD card folder right here, you can see that my image file is here in the folder as well, along with the original zip folder that I had downloaded. So go ahead and move this image file to the SD card folder on your computer. And then once you're done, we'll go ahead with the next step. So we can check off this step here, copy the image file to C SD card. And again, if you're not using a C drive, change this letter to whatever drive on your computer you're using. So the next step here says copy the .rom files to the .bin folder. And again, when you unzip that folder, you should end up with, like I said, these two .rom files here. And now we need to move those two files somewhere. So again, where do we need to move those two files to? It says right here, copy the .rom files, or you can move them. It doesn't matter if you copy them or move them, but they need to end up in the dot, well, it doesn't need, it's actually not a dot bin folder. It's just the bin folder. So those two dot .rom files need to end up in this bin folder. And you can see right here, the bin folder is under our project one folder, which is under our next dev folder. So if we go ahead and look at our bin folder, so here I'm in my next dev folder and I'll click on project one or double click on project one. And here we have our bin folder and I'll double click on that. And for now, just ignore all these files down here. You shouldn't have these files on your computer yet because obviously I've been playing around with this environment. So you won't have these files down here. Just ignore those. I'm going to open up my bin folder. And there's a lot of extra stuff here that you don't need to worry about yet either. So right now, all we're interested in is these two dot rom files which are right here this one here ennextzx.rom and ennextmmc.rom so those were two of the files that we just unzipped you want to go ahead and copy them or move them to this bin folder and once you're done that we go back over here and we check off our checklist here so that's done now what is the next step we want to do is download the cspect emulator. Now I showed how to do this in a previous video, but I'm gonna show it again. Uh, it's very easy to do. All we do is if you take a look at my note here, right here, it says cspect.org. And I guess I should have put a clickable link here, but anyway, I'll just I'll just navigate to cspect.org there. So this is the cspect.org uh, website and it's labeled the life of a games programmer at the top here. And if we go down here, to this section that says download cspect v2.15.1 emulator and this version number may have changed by the time you watch this video but at the time of recording this video the latest version of the cspect emulator is version 2.15.1 now i can't actually just click on this link to download this file because it doesn't work for whatever reason on my computer i need to actually do this in an incognito window so i'm going to right click on it instead and then I'm going to left click on open link in incognito window right here. And so it opens an incognito window for me. And if I single click on the search bar up here, and then I'll press enter, 
it downloads the file for me here as a zip file and so i'll just open this and select show in folder and here it is right here cspect.zip so obviously i've downloaded it a few times now so now i've got the cspect zip file downloaded and let's see what i need to do with it i'll go back to my instructions here and we finished this step download the cspect emulator right here so i can go ahead and check this one off that's one more step done and the next step is unzip the contents of the cspect zip file into the bin folder so now we want the contents of this zipped cspect folder to be unzipped into the bin folder so let's go ahead and do that now i'll just navigate to my downloads folder which is right here and i'm going to double click on the zip file and these are all the folders and files that are contained within the zip file of course and i'm going to click extract all up here and it's going to ask me where to put it so i'm going to click browse over here and i'll change this to c next dev because that's the folder that is at the top level of this whole development environment that we're creating so i'll double click on that and i'll double click on my project one folder here and it said to put it in the bin folder i'm going to select the bin folder i'll double click on it and i'll click right here for select folder and that's where it's going to unzip it now into c next to dev project one bin and that's where we want these cspect folders and files to be unzipped to so i'll go ahead and click extract now and there it's unzipped them now you can see into the project one bin folder which is where this should be so inside the bin folder we should now have all these folders here this 3x aoy folder this beast folder and all these other folders here uh, except some of them most of them we should have some of them we haven't installed yet we'll be doing that in a moment but now you should have most of these folders installed in your bin folder as well so let's go back to our checklist and we'll check that off right there all right so now we've got the cspec folder unzipped into the bin folder and now let's see what we do next next it says download and install open al so this is a sound i don't know if it's a sound file or exactly what you call this but it basically allows the cspec emulator to play sounds so we need to download and install this and let's take a look at my note here where it tells me where to do that which is right here www.openl.org download so i'll just click on that and you can find these in the description down below of course and so if i click on that it brings me to this page here and i'm installing on windows so i'm going to click on this picture down here where it says windows installer zip and so i'll click on that and here it's downloaded a zip file you can see and i'll find that in my folder where it's downloaded it which is right here so here i have a zip file called or a zipped folder called oalinst1.zip and yours won't be called one because i've already downloaded this once so that's why i gave it that one label yours probably won't have that one after it so i'm just going to double click on this and this one contains one single file which is oalinst.exe so i'm going to go ahead and click extract all up here to extract that single file and it's going to ask me where to extract it to this one doesn't really matter where you extract it to because we're going to execute this file and wherever you happen to put it we'll just execute it there so in this case i'm going to just extract it to my downloads folder so because it should work there so i'll go ahead and click extract and there it is here in my downloads folder and i'll double click on this exe file to install it and it will come up with a pop-up window asking if you want to go ahead and install it because windows might give you a warning message just allow it to install it if it does and then it should come up with an open al window which uh, asks you to agree to the license so click ok there and then it should show you a pop-up that says installation complete and then click ok on that pop-up and now we can go back to our instruction list and we can check off that step of download and install open al so that is done now if you've gotten to this point in the process uh, there's one more thing i think we could do at this point which is to test the cspec emulator to make sure it's been downloaded and installed correctly so let's go ahead and do that now and the way we do that is by going to the place where we unzipped all those cspec files and folders which is right here in the bin folder remember so we'll go ahead and take a look at our bin folder which is right here i'm in my bin folder now so first let's go ahead and test to see if the emulator is working and the way we do that is we just find this file here called cspec.exe and we double click on it 
and it should open this emulator window right here. So you may notice this is just the way a regular Sinclair Spectrum computer looks when you power it on. This is not operating currently in ZX Spectrum Next mode, which is okay. We just want to test its basic functionality that has been installed correctly. And so far this works, which is good. So let's go ahead and close this emulator and we'll try a couple of the sample files. So let's go ahead and find this beast.bat file right here and we'll double click on it. And it should open this emulator window and start running this uh, Shadow of the Beast demo. So this should be working at this point and I'll just press escape to stop that. And there's no sound in that demo. So now we want to go ahead and test the sound, which we'll do by running another demo file called modplayer.bat right here. So go ahead and double click on modplayer.bat and it should open the emulator again. And just press escape every time you want to close the emulator. But this demo file should be playing sound for us now. So if you're running that file and you hear sound and you see these little blue stripes jumping up and down, then so far everything is working fine. And we can go ahead and close this emulator and continue on with our install instructions. Now the next step here says download SJASM Plus Assembler. So when we create our Z80 assembly language programs, we're just going to be doing that in a, an editor and we need somehow to convert that assembly language program into a machine code program, of course, and we need to do that using an assembler. And this is the assembler we're going to use, SJASM Plus. So we're going to download this assembler. And if we take a look at my note here, there's again another link that we click on to find and download this assembler. So let's go ahead and click on this link. And it brings us to this site here. And down here you can see there's a link here to a zip file called SJASM Plus dash 1.18.3.win.zip and this version number might be different by the time you do this so I'm just going to click on this link to download the zip file and now we can go back and check off this step where we downloaded that assembler and our next step here says copy sjasmplus.exe to the bin folder it must be with the cspec emulator so we already installed the cspec files into the bin folder. Now we need to copy this sjasmplus.exe file to that folder as well. So first we need to go ahead and unzip those sjasmplus files. And so my downloaded folder is right here, sjasmplus right here, dot zip. And so I'm going to double click on this and you can see it has one folder inside of it. And if I double click on this folder, we can see there are two folders inside of that and then these three files here. So I need to unzip these folders and files. So now I'm going to click extract all and it's going to ask me where to extract them. So I'll browse here to my bin folder, which is right here, next dev project one bin, and I'll click select folder and extract. So now the file we're interested in is this sjasmplus.exe file right here and it should be in our bin folder. So if I go ahead and look for it here, I have my sjasmplus.exe file right here under my bin folder. Now if your extraction created another folder like this one here, it might have created this folder sjasmplus-1 dot whatever revision number is following it when you happen to install it. But if you have this folder here instead of this exe file sjasmplus, so then just go ahead and double click on this uh, folder to open it. And you'll see this exe file right here. Just copy that file up into the bin folder. And once you've got that file copied over, then we can go ahead and check off this step. Right here, we've copied our sjasmplus.exe file to the bin folder, and we'll check this off. Okay, so this is taking a long time, and I told you it would, but it's not difficult, these steps that we're doing. We just have to be very careful and make sure that we set up these folders properly in the correct uh, structure and we copy all these files where they need to be. So we'll continue along with this process and by the end of this process, I promise you're going to be happy to have this development environment installed because it's actually really slick once we've got it installed when we want to create our programs. And I promise we're going to get there and you're going to be happy you did this effort to make it all work. So let's go ahead and look at our next instruction. 
and it says download HDF monkey and extract the HDF monkey.exe file to the bin folder. So just like we just did with this SJASM plus.exe folder and file, we downloaded that, unzipped it, copied the exe file into the bin folder. Now it's asking us to do the same thing with this HDF monkey uh, file and it wants us to download it and copy this HDF monkey exe file into the bin folder as well. Now here we're going to take a little kind of intermission where I need to explain what this step uh, is all about. If you're already familiar with HDF monkey, you can go ahead and fast forward this section of the video. But if you're not familiar with HDF monkey, then pay attention because this part is important to understand. So remember how we discussed earlier about the image file for the ZX Spectrum Next computer? That image file that we downloaded is what allows the C-Spec emulator to emulate a ZX Spectrum Next computer. And normally when you're using a ZX Spectrum Next computer, you can go into the menu system and you can navigate through the menu system and find the different files and games that you want to run. So if you have a game installed on your ZX Spectrum Next computer, an actual ZX Spectrum Next computer, the real hardware I'm talking about, then you can go through the menu system and find a game file that you want to run and you can select it and run it. Now, if you're using an emulator, such as we're going to be doing with the C-Spec emulator, you can follow the same process if you want you can go through the menu system and find a game you want to run or find a program you want to open. But those programs and games have to be installed into that image file that we were just discussing because that image file is what contains all the folder structures and the files that the ZX Spectrum emulator, C-Spec, knows how to access or is able to access. So if you want to use the C-Spec emulator to run programs and run games, those programs and games have to be installed or injected into the image file. They can't just be stored on our Windows hard drive. They can't just be stored in any folder we want on our computer. Those programs and games and whatnot have to be in the image file. Otherwise, the C-Spec emulator won't know how to access them. It won't be able to find them. And that is what this HDF monkey program or utility actually does. It allows us to both inject programs into the C-Spec image file or the ZX Spectrum Next image file so that the emulator can access them. And it also allows us to extract files from that image file. So let's say we have a game. We have a game. Let's say we have a Pac-Man game and we want to play that Pac-Man game. We've downloaded this Pac-Man file from the internet and we want to play this Pac-Man game using our emulator. Well, we first have to get that Pac-Man game into the image file of our emulator. So we use this HDF monkey to do that. And similarly, if we wanted to extract a program or a game, well, specifically a file, if we wanted to extract a file from that image file, we would use this HDF monkey program. Now, having explained all that, I should mention one more thing, which is we don't actually need to do this step because although it explains to do this step in the instructions on the SpecNext website, uh, I found a way to get around this step that you're probably already familiar with if you watched my C-Spec video, but we are going to actually improve this process, like I mentioned. So by the time we're finished, we want to be able to run our programs that we create quickly and efficiently. So we don't want to have to run this HDF monkey program and insert them into the uh, image file and then extract them from the image file later if we wanted to extract them or manipulate them or whatnot. So we actually are not going to be using this step in our development process, but if you want to, you can go ahead and download this HDF monkey program just so you have it on hand in case you ever do want to use it. So this is actually the link that I'm going to use to find this uh, HDF monkey file, uto.specky.org. So if I click on this one, it brings me to this page here and it says UTO's 8-bit page. I don't know what that is. So I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here where it says other stuff. And here it says HDF monkey. Right here, if I zoom in other stuff, it says HDF monkey here. And if you look at this sentence, it says I've managed to compile HDF monkey and utility to handle HDF files with command line orders for Windows. You can find it here. So this here word here is a link. And if I click on it, 
it automatically downloads the zip file down here. So there's the zip file and I'm going to just uh, show it in the folder which is right here. So I'll double click on it and here you can see there's an hdfmonkey.exe file inside and if I extract all and it's going to ask me where to extract it and again I want to extract this into the bin folder so I'll just browse to it next dev project one bin okay so I'm in the bin folder here and I'll click select folder and here it is C next dev project one bin and I'll click extract and now it should be in my bin folder which is right here hdfmonkey.exe so again I'm not using this in my development environment uh, yet because I don't need to but I have it installed in case I need it so let's check that off our list right here download hdfmonkey and extract the hdfmonkey.exe file to the bin folder done so our next step says install sublime text editor so in this development process you're probably aware that in order to create our z80 assembly language programs we need an editor to actually allow us to type in those programs and so originally i was trying to do this using the visual studio code editor and you can use the visual studio code editor if you want as i mentioned i was trying to use this visual studio code editor and configure all the different files and options that i needed to get it to do more stuff than it really needs to do at this point and i couldn't get that all working and so the way my development environment works at this point is i'm using the text editor strictly to create these z80 assembly files so i'm not using it to do any kind of building it's not going to be running the files in an emulator or doing any fancy stuff all it's doing is acting strictly as a text editor and saving the file to the computer so you can use whatever editor you want you can use visual studio code if you like in this case i'm going to use sublime text just because i tried it out and it works and it seems uh, to be good for me i like the way it looks it has kind of a, a modern but kind of retro look to it with the color schemes and everything so i'm going to be using uh, sublime text in this uh, example and when you're choosing a text editor for creating your z80 assembly language programs i recommend you choose one that has an option or a plugin that allows it to give you at least syntax highlighting for z80 assembly language programs because it's really cool to have the highlighting there to show you the different uh, elements of your program being colored in different colors so obviously Visual Studio Code and also Sublime Text does have syntax highlighting as a feature for creating Z80 assembly language programs. So in this case, I'm using Sublime Text, but you can use whatever text editor you want. But I'll show you how I install Sublime Text. And if we look over here, I have a link here that brings us to a page where we can download it. So I'll go ahead and click on that. And it brings me to this page here, sublimetext.com forward slash download. So to download it, I'll click on this link right here, Windows. And you can see they also have versions for Mac OS and Linux, but I'm going to be using uh, the Windows version, obviously, on my Windows computer. And here it's downloaded an EXE file. So if I go ahead and click on this, it brings me a pop-up window that allows me to install it. So I'll click Next, and I'll click Install. And now I should have the Sublime Text text editor installed on my computer and if I look at my Windows menu here and I scroll down to it right here I have sublime text installed and if I right click on it I can say pin to start or I can go down here and pin to my taskbar I've already got it pinned on my taskbar and if I click on that it opens the editor which looks like this and you can see I've got a program in here that I was working on but this is what the text editor looks like it's a very simple installation. You just download it and install this file and then click on the icon and open it. So you might want to go ahead and try that now just to make sure that your uh, text editor opens, whatever editor you decide to use. So I'll go ahead and close this now. And I'll go back to my uh, checklist and I'll check off this step for install Sublime Text Editor because that's done. And now we just keep moving right along with our next step, which is installing z80 asm plugin for sublime text editor now the text editor that i have installed here the sublime text editor 
doesn't uh, really recognize that I'm typing in a Z80 assembly language program. So this next step is going to install a plugin that allows the editor to recognize when I'm entering a Z80 assembly language program. And that is this plugin right here. It's called Z80 ASM. That's the name of the plugin for this Sublime text editor. And if you're using a different text editor, for example, Visual Studio Code, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and install whatever extensions you need to allow your text editor to recognize that you're typing in a Z80 assembly language program as well. But in my case, I need to install this Z80 ASM plugin. So I'll go ahead and click on this link and it brings me to this page here where it says Sublime Text Z80 ASM right there. And if I click on this uh, link right here, I can go over to this code button and click on that. And then I can download the zip file here. And so now that's downloaded. And if I go back to the previous page for a moment, I just wanna show you if you scroll down to the bottom, it gives you instructions. Uh, well, it gives you details about this plugin as well, right here, product info. And it also gives you installation and configuration instructions, which is exactly what we're going to be doing today. But if you wanna read about uh, this product and the instructions, you can go ahead and go down here and read all these details at the bottom of the page, or actually about the middle of the page and you can get some more information about it there. So if I go back to my instruction sheet here, I'll just follow these steps. So I'm installing this Z80 ASM plugin, and I'm just going to go to the next step here where it kind of breaks down the steps for me. And it says, click on code, which I did, which is this big green button here, which I clicked on, and then click download zip, which I did. So it's already downloaded into my computer. And now it says, copy the Z80 ASM folder into the packages folder in Sublime Text. So now we need to find this packages folder, which is in our Sublime Text installation. So we need to find where our Sublime Text program was installed. And the way I'm going to do that is by going to the Windows logo here at the bottom left, scrolling down to that uh, program name, which is right here, Sublime Text. And if I right click on it and select more, and then if I click on this open file location option, it opens the location where this uh, Sublime Text program was installed on my computer. And remember now we're looking for this packages folder because that's where we need to install this plugin. So I'll go back and take a look for that. So in my case, I just installed this Sublime Text program directly on my desktop, which is right here. You see my desktop is selected here. And here you can see my Sublime Text folder. That's where I chose to install it. So I'm just going to uh, open up this folder and look for the packages folder, which is right here. So if we look at our instructions here, it says copy the Z80 ASM folder into the packages folder in Sublime Text. So let's find this Z80 ASM folder. So here in my downloads folder, I have my Sublime Text uh, zip file that was downloaded. So I'm going to double click on that. And here you can see there's a Sublime Text Z80 ASM master folder that's within this zipped folder. So I'm going to extract that by double clicking extract all. And you can extract that wherever you like. And then once it's extracted, you just double click on it here. And within that folder is going to be this Z80 ASM folder, which is what we need to move over to our editor. So I'm going to just right click this and select copy and then remember our instructions. It says we need to copy that folder into the packages folder in Sublime Text. So I'll go back there. Right here's my packages folder. I'll double click on that to open it. And I've already installed it right here. So I've already pasted it into this folder. So you can go ahead and copy that folder into this packages folder as well. And you should end up with a folder called Z80 ASM underneath the packages folder in your Sublime Text editor as well. And now let's just go back to our instruction list and check off that step. So now this plugin will allow the text editor, Sublime Text, to recognize Z80 assembly language programs when we type them in. But there's one more improvement that we need to install to this text editor program in this case, which is our next step right here, which says, install the modification to Z80 ASM plugin to recognize the new Z80 opcodes. So I'm sure as you know, opcodes are the instructions that we uh, type in when we enter a Z80 assembly language program. 
and you can see there's a modification to that plugin we just installed that allows it to recognize the new opcodes that are used with the ZX Spectrum Next computer. So now we want to modify this editor even more so that can, it can work better with the ZX Spectrum Next computer in particular. And if we take a look at my notes, again, there's a link. And in this case, it's a link to a Facebook uh, post. And so I'll click on that. And you see it brings me to a Facebook page where there's a note here that has a file that we need, which is right here, z80asmmod.zip. So I'm just going to click on this and it's downloading it here for me, mod.zip. So I'll find this folder right here in my downloads. I'll double click on it. And you can see there's two folders inside of it, one called Mac OS X and one called Z80ASM mod. And let's go back to our instruction page. And it says here, download the zip file, extract the files and copy the Z80ASM.tm language file to Z80ASM folder within the packages folder in Sublime. So that might seem complicated, but don't get discouraged yet. We're gonna take it really slow and it's not a problem. So let's see what we're doing here exactly. We want to download the zip file, which we just did. And now we need to extract the files. So let's go ahead and do that. So right here in my downloads folder, remember I have this Z80ASM mod file that I just downloaded or folder that I just downloaded. So I'm gonna double click on that and here are the contents of it. They're still zipped, so I'm going to extract them. And you can just extract them anywhere. I'll extract them in my downloads folder. And here now these two folders are extracted. And if we go back to our instructions, our instructions say copy the z80asm.tm language file to somewhere. So first let's find this file that we need to copy. So we're looking for a file called z80asm dot tm language so let's go back to my folder and these are the two folders that we just unzipped and i'm not interested in the mac os x folder because i'm not using a mac so i'm just going to double click on this one called z80asm mod and there you go right here we have a file z80asm dot tm language but before i do anything with it i just want to draw your attention to this file called readme.txt let's go ahead and open that and here we have the contents. And the reason I wanted to open this is because this has some important information you might want to keep for your reference. And let's just read it now. I'll just zoom in a bit here. And here's the contents. It says, this file modifies the Z80ASM Sublime Text plugin to correctly highlight the new next Z80 opcodes. So that's pretty useful. We want that feature, right? And it says, simply locate the existing file in the Sublime Packages folder and replace it with this one. And then finally, it says, if you don't already have the Z80ASM plugin, it can be downloaded from this link here. Well, we do already have the Z80ASM plugin because we just installed it. So now what we want to do is replace one of the files within that plugin. And the file we want to replace it with is this one right here, Z80ASM.tm.language. So go ahead and right click on this, select copy, and then we'll navigate back to our editor folder which remember for me was on my desktop and it's right here, Sublime Text. So I'll double click on that. And remember we want the packages folder. So I'll double click on the packages folder. And now we should be replacing a file within this folder. And so I'm just gonna go over here to the uh, margin over here and right click and click paste. Because remember I've already copied this language file and I'm gonna paste it now into this packages folder. So I'll select paste and it gives me the option to replace the existing file in the destination. So that's exactly what we want to do. We want to replace an existing file with this new one. So I'll click on this to select that. And now that's done. That's all we had to do. So we'll go back to our checklist now. And that is another step that we've completed. We installed the modification to the Z80 ASM plugin. Actually, we completed both of these steps right here by uh, copying that file over we've completed this step so now we have our text editor installed which in this case is the sublime text editor and we installed a plugin for it that allows it to recognize z80 assembly language programs that we're going to be typing in and we installed a further modification to that plugin to allow it to use 
the new Z80 assembly language opcodes that the ZX Spectrum Next is able to uh, use. And if you've been able to handle everything so far, what we're going to do from now on is no more difficult than what we've already done. So we're that much closer to having our fantastic development environment set up on our computer. So let's go ahead and keep going through these instructions and we'll get it all done and then we'll be ready to start making some games, right? Okay, so let's see what's next in our list of instructions. Uh, here the instruction says, customize the build.bat file in the Z80 ASM folder of Sublime Text. So I'm not going to do this. Uh, you can try and figure this out if you want to. But basically what this means is, I believe there are some files that we can modify if we know how, which will give this uh, editor more functionality to automatically build our programs and uh, assemble them for us. So now I've got the text editor open on the screen. And if you go over here, you can see there's a Z80 ASM option on the top menu here. And if I click on that, it gives me some options, one of which is going down here and looking at settings. And here we have some options for main settings, build settings, build script for Windows, build script for Linux, build script for OS X, emulator script for Windows. And so I think these are files that can be modified that will allow it to do other tasks for us. If you want to play around with it, I guess maybe you can if you know what you're doing, but I don't know what I'm doing. And there are some batch files that we can modify. So here I am in the desktop, Sublime Text, Packages folder. And remember, we installed this Z80 ASM folder in the Packages folder. So if I go ahead and open that, then we should find a batch file here called build.bat. And there's another one called buildrun.bat and another one called run.bat. So I was trying to play around with these batch files to increase its functionality. I couldn't figure it out, but if you want to try and play with it again, if you know what you're doing. So I think these files are how I would need to modify the functionality to allow this editor to automatically assemble our programs and run them in the emulator. But I don't know how to do that, so I'm just gonna skip this step for now. So I'm not going to do this step and I'm just gonna scroll down here to our next step which says, use an editor to create a file called project.asm and save it in the source folder. Okay, so now we're getting into the fun stuff. I'm gonna go back to my editor here. So I'm gonna create a file called project.asm. But what do I need to put in this file? Well, if we go back to my list here, I made a note over here of what we need to include in this file. And where I got this is from the SpecNext website. So here I am back on the Spec Next Dev website, where we're in this section here, creating a Z80 assembly development environment on Windows. And if we scroll down here, it has an example of a file that we need to create, which is right here at the bottom, where it says source code, right here. So I'm just going to copy and paste this entire section of code here into my editor. And I'm going to just paste it in here. So there. Now we have this uh, boilerplate file copied into our editor, and I'm going to go ahead and save it with the name of project.asm. So how we do that is, well, easy enough. We just go to the file selection up here, and I'm gonna choose save as, and I want to save it into my source folder. Remember, so if I go down to my C drive, and then I go to my next dev folder, and then I go to my project one folder, and then here's my source folder right here. So I'm going to double click on that. And now you can see I've already got a couple uh, files saved here. Here's my project.asm file here, which I've already saved. So you can go ahead and save this file named project.asm as well. You just go down here, obviously, and call it project.asm. And remember, you have to actually type in this .asm extension. Otherwise, it won't work. So we just save this file as project.asm in this source folder and we click save. So now that's done, I can check this off. And I just put this note here indicating a couple different editors we might want to use, Sublime Text or VS Code. And now let's go take a look at our next instruction, which actually isn't really an instruction, it's more of just a note. It says, check this link for save next options. So if you take a look at that file that we just saved, it has these things called save next options, which I have no idea uh, how to use them or what they do. But if you want to learn more information about them, you simply click on this link here. 
and it brings you to a page called Chapter 8 Save Next Guide and you can go ahead and read through these uh, detailed description of each Save Next command in case you want to learn more about exactly how this program works. If you want to learn more about it, go ahead and click on the link and you can read all about it. So I'll check this off. And now we're getting near the end. We only have three major sections left to go. So you're doing great. Just hang in there and we'll get to the end. And believe me, you're going to enjoy it once we're done. So here our next step says, create an m.bat file and save it in the project one folder. And I'm actually going to go through all three of these remaining steps uh, at once just to give you an indication of what we're looking at to finish off this development setup. So you can see this step says create an m.bat file and save it in the project one folder. This next step says create a file called r.bat and this next one says alternatively create a combined batch file make.bat. Now these three instructions are telling us to create three different batch files and if you don't know what a batch file is, a batch file is a simple text file that we create that gives the computer instructions on what to do. So before we actually do these, let's take a look at what these batch files are going to do for us. And so we need to be clear about what a batch file is and how it works. So what we're going to be doing basically is just opening a notepad, entering some instructions into it as text. Those are going to be converted into a batch file, which we do simply by saving it with a name that ends in the .bat extension. And so these are just going to be three simple text files that tell the computer what to do. And let's take a look at what each of these files are meant to do. So this first one here called m.bat, and I've just chosen this m to represent make. You can name it whatever you want really, but I just chose m.bat. So if you want to change it to something else.bat, it's up to you. But I just chose m.bat, and here's what it does. It says, this will, Boy, my spelling is bad. This will, this will assemble your program and create the following two files in the C Next Dev Project One folder. So remember what we want to do when we're creating our programs is we're going to be typing in Z80 assembly language programs, but then of course we need to assemble them into machine code, right? So in this case, what we're going to do is we want to assemble these programs into this type of file here called a dot nex file which is a file that the zx spectrum next computer or the zx spectrum next emulator in this case the cspect emulator can run so these are the files that we're actually going to be running in our emulator so we need to assemble our assembly language program into a dot nex file so this first batch file that we're going to create here m.bat is going to create actually two files it's going to create a project.nex file, which is a program we can run in our emulator. And it's also going to create this project.map file, which I have no idea what that does. So I'm not really worried about it yet at this point in my journey. I'll check that out later. But let's take a look at what this batch file will contain. So here's my note here, which says at echo off, and then some other stuff here. So this top part here is what we need to put in this first batch file in order to create our .nex file, which we can run in our emulator. And the way we create this, you can just simply copy and paste this. So if I right click here and copy, and I'll open a notepad. So here's my notepad. I'll simply paste this code into this notepad window like that. And here's what it says. It says at echo off, and then it says bin sjasm plus source project.asm ZX next, C spec message, whatever. So you can look up and see what all these instructions do, but basically what they do is, first it's going to look for this bin folder, and then it's going to look for this file, which is the SJASM plus file. So this is the assembler file that's going to assemble our program for us, and it's located in the bin folder. And then if we take a look at this part here, it says SRC, which we know is our source folder, where we save our assembly language file or our .asm files, which we just did. We just saved a file called project.asm, which is right here, project.asm. So this is the source file that it's going to assemble using this SJASM plus assembler. And it's going to use these options, ZX next equals CSpec. It's going to use the CSpec emulator. And then this last one just indicates what type of messages it's going to show while it's assembling. So it's going to show us 
uh, the error messages, but it's not going to show us a bunch of extra stuff. So there we go. We have our first batch file ready to go. So now we just save it. And if we look here, it says to create the batch file and save it in the project one folder. So here's our batch file and we need to save it in the project one folder. And we're going to save it with the name m.bat. So we click file, save as, and here I'm on my C drive in my next dev folder and then my project one folder. And that's where I want to save it in my project one folder. So that's where I am. And I want to call it m.bat. So I'm going to type in here m.bat, just like that, and I'll click Save, and now that's saved. And we'll go back to our instruction list here, and we'll check off this create an m.bat file and save it in the Project 1 folder, because we just did that. And this one here is just a note, so we can just check that off as well. Now let's see what our next instruction says, right down here. It says create a file called r.bat. So I'll just go back to my notepad window, and let's see what we need to put in that file. I'll scroll over here to my note, and here's the code for our r.bat batch file right here. So I'm going to copy this and I'll just paste it into the same notepad window. I'll just highlight this and delete that. And then I'll paste our new code. And now, so remember our first batch file creates that .nex file that we can run in our emulator. And this batch file is the one that actually runs it in the emulator. So let's take a look at what this does. So here we have a bin instruction here, which is looking for the bin folder, and it's going to find this cspect.exe file, which is the emulator file. So it's going to run our emulator. And then there's a whole bunch of options here that uh, do different things. And if you want to find out about these options, you can look at the readme.txt file in the cspect folder, or you can go back and watch the video that I made about installing the cspect emulator, where I described what these different uh, options do. But they basically do various things like, for example, this W3 selects what window size we want the emulator to open in, what physical size of the window we want to see on the screen. So this is window size number three, and this 60 is for 60 hertz. And then here there's a ZX Next option, which allows it to emulate a ZX Next computer and so forth. And I'm not actually sure what this map option here does. So again, I haven't learned that yet, but I'll be interested to figure out what that does. And now our last option here is the important one where you can see at the end here, it says project.nex. So this project.nex is the file that our first batch file that we just finished creating is going to create when it assembles our assembly language program. So we type in our assembly language program. We execute that first batch file called m.bat and it creates this project.nex file. And now this batch file is going to actually execute this project.nex file and automatically run it in our cspec emulator. So now let's go ahead and save this batch file by going File, Save As. And again, we want to save this one in our Project 1 folder. And this one we're going to name r.bat, just like that, and save. And now we go back to our instruction sheet and we can check off this instruction where we create a file called r.bat. And here there's just a note that says this will automatically run your project.nex file in the cspect emulator. Right there. So we'll check that off. And now finally let's take a look at our last step in this whole process. So we're almost there and if you've made it this far you should be very proud of yourself because <laughs> it took me six months to get this far. Of course I'm not very bright but anyway. So let's take a look at the last instruction here and see what we're supposed to do. It says, alternatively, create a combined batch file, make.bat. So it makes sense that instead of having two separate batch files, one that's going to create our .nex file when it assembles our program, and then another one that actually runs that .nex file in our emulator, we can just combine those two batch files into one and save it as a file called make.bat. And I think we can also configure this text editor to automatically look for a file called make.bat and do this automatically for us when we uh, build the file in the text editor. But like I said, I haven't figured that out uh, just yet, so I'm not going to have the editor automatically run this file for us, but I'm still going to go ahead and create this make.bat file, and that will save me having to run two separate batch files. And here we have the code that I need to include in that batch file. 
right here. So I'll copy that and I'll delete our previous instructions here and I'll paste it in there. And now here is our instruction for the combined batch file. And it just contains all the instructions that we just looked at. Here we have this bin sjasm plus, which assembles our program using this source file project.asm. That's why we're saving our project file as project.asm. So when we're entering our Z80 assembly language program, we need to make sure to save it as project.asm. Otherwise this whole thing won't work and we need to save it in the source folder. So here we've just combined all those instructions into one lump and we're going to go ahead and save this as a file called make.bat. So I'll click file, save as, and we're still in our project one folder here. And again, I'll call this make.bat and save. And we can go back to our instructions here and check this off where it tells us to create a combined batch file called make.bat. And here's just some notes. It says this will automatically assemble your program, create the .nex and .map files, and run your program in CSpec. So like I was mentioning before, we no longer need to use that HDF monkey utility to inject our program into the image for the emulator and then manually uh, find that file using the menu system within the emulator and run it that way. This way, it's just going to automatically assemble our program, create the .nex file, and load it into the CSpec emulator and run it for us all at once. So that's going to be really cool, and we're going to actually do that in a moment. So I'll just check this off, and then this last note here is going to make our job even easier, and we'll just read it here. It says, you can run this program from within a terminal window to speed things up. So obviously when we're uh, running a batch file normally in Windows, we just uh, navigate to that batch file and double click on it with our mouse and that'll run the file. But if we do that process in a terminal window, that speeds things up even more. And I'll show you that in a moment. So let's go ahead and check this off. And believe it or not, we are done setting up our development environment. So let's go ahead and test it out now and see how easy it is to use. All right, so are you ready to try out this development environment where we can create Z80 assembly language programs and execute them in our C-Spec emulator? I hope you are because we just spent a lot of work setting this thing up. So I'll start from the beginning and show you how we would use this development environment. And so here I've just loaded this file that we saved called project.asm and it has all these red lines in here, which I'll take care of in a moment. So first I just want to go ahead and resave this so we're familiar with uh, the environment that we're using. So let me go back up here to File and select Save As. And remember, I need to save this in my source folder. And for me, that's here on my C drive. And then I go to my Next Dev folder here. And then I go to my Project 1 folder here. And right down here is my source file, SRC. So I'll double click on that to open it up. And I've already saved it right here as project.asm. I'll save it again. So there I've saved this file as project.asm. Now, if you don't have these uh, folders showing on the left side here, all you need to do is go to file up here and then open folder right here. And then you select your project folder, which for me is showing right here, C drive, next dev, project one, and here it's selecting source. So I'm just gonna select the project one folder here and click select folder down here. And then so now it's just showing me these different folders and files over on the left side here. And I can find my file again by just clicking on this SRC folder. And then here's my project.asm file right here. I'll just single click on that. And there we go. I've got my file back now. So this is my Z80 assembly language program. And the first thing I want to do is just get rid of these red lines here. So I th I'm guessing this editor maybe doesn't like blank lines. So I'm just going to delete these blank lines because all these red lines have nothing in them. So I'm just going to delete them all. And now these red lines are disappearing. And there's a little dot here now. So if I click File, Save, this dot changes to an X, which means the current version of our program that we have on the screen is actually saved. So this is uh, what our boilerplate or template program should look like.
So now let's take a look at this file. And if it seems confusing, don't worry about it because it's okay if it seems confusing. We don't need to understand all of this, but there is uh, one part of it we do need to understand. And luckily it's not this part here at the bottom. This has to do with these save next options that we took a look at a bit earlier. And I shared a link with you where you can go look at the web page that describes what all these different save next options do. So you can go ahead and read that web page now and that will help you understand what this bottom section does. But the part we do need to be interested in is the top part here. So all these top lines here, we need to know exactly what they do. So let's go through them one by one. And it's pretty easy because there aren't very many of them. So these top three lines here are obviously just comments because they have these semicolons and it says right here, sample code. And the next line here, line four says, allow the next paging and instructions. And it says device ZX Spectrum Next. So make sure you have this device ZX Spectrum Next line in your program as well, which you should. And now the next line here says, generate a map file for use with CSpec. I don't know what the map file does yet, but your program should look like this as well. It should have that comment. And then line seven here says CSpec and then project.map. So this creates that .map file that we saw in our output earlier or in our instructions earlier. And again, I don't know what it does, but that's okay. I'll figure it out at some point in this journey, I guess, when I need to. So here, let's take a look at the sample program that this file has included for us. So here we have an org instruction, which we're all familiar with by now. And here there's a sample program here that has a label called start. And here it has an LDA comma four instruction, which says right here, set A to green. So four is the number code for the color green. And it's loading that into the A register. So it's loading the number four into the A register and four represents the color green, as I just mentioned. And here it has an instruction out FE comma A. So this instruction changes the border color right here. There's a note that says change the border and that should change it to the color green because we just loaded the number four, which represents the color green into the A register. And here is a jump relative instruction. JR stands for jump relative. And here it just has a dollar sign. It doesn't indicate a memory location or a label where it wants the program to jump to. So I think it's just gonna jump continuously back to this same line. It's just gonna continuously execute this JR jump relative instruction. It's going to pause our program indefinitely by continuously looping back to the same memory address over and over again. So this is a sample program that should change our border color to green. And we're going to execute this program uh, in a moment. But before we do that, just in case it's not obvious, I just want to indicate and point out that when we're creating our own programs, all we need to do is modify this section here, right? So we leave this bottom section as it is, all these lines 14 through lines 30, when you're creating your own Z80 assembly language programs, just leave this stuff at the bottom. So all we need to do is modify these lines here uh, from the org statement down to the bottom of our program. So we already have a sample program here loaded into our editor and let's see how we would use our development environment. So remember all we're using our editor for in this case is to enter and save our assembly language program. And we can see here we've entered our program obviously and we saved it as this file called project.asm and our program needs to be called project.asm because that's uh, the file name that we used in our configuration files that we just set up. So make sure you call your program project.asm unless you wanna go back and update the configuration files that we made. So now that we've created our program and we've saved it as a file name called project.asm, we need to go back and take a look at those batch files. So this is what our file and folder structure should look like. We have our next dev folder. And then within that, we have our project one folder. And then within that, we have these four folders that we created. And we have these three files that we created, m.bat, r.bat, and make.bat. So let's go ahead and try out these super cool batch files. Now, what do they do? Well, the m.bat file should automatically create our .nex file and our .map file. And how do we execute it? We just double click on it and it automatically knows how to convert our program uh, from an assembly language program into a .nex file. So let's double click on that 
and we should expect to see a couple files show up here. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So there you go. We now have two new files created. This one called project.map and this one called project.nex. So this .nex file is the one that we can run in our emulator. And how do we do that? Well, we use our other batch file right here, which is r.bat, and we double click on that, and that should run our project file in our emulator. So let's give it a shot. And there we go. We have our emulator running here, which did what the program was intended to do, which changed the border color to green. So let's exit out of our emulator here by pressing escape. And then we'll go back to our editor right here. And now instead of green, let's change this color from number four to let's say number three, which should be magenta. And then remember we have to save this program and I'm just gonna press control S to save it. There we go, it should be saved now. And if I go back to our folder that contains our batch files right here, I'll go ahead and run this m.bat file again. And now that should have updated our NEX file with our new color. So let's go ahead and run our r.bat file again here and see if we get a magenta border this time. And we do. You see how easy that is to, to use this development environment now? So let's go ahead and make it even easier now by exiting out of this emulator. And we'll go back to our editor once again and we'll change this color to, let's say, color number two, which should be red. And I'll save it again by pressing Control S. So now it's saved, and I'll go back to my folder with my batch files. And now let's go ahead and delete this .map file, as well as this .nex file. And you see this process also creates these other uh, files here, cspec.log and cspect underline win.dat. But now let's go ahead and try using our make.bat file instead, which automatically performs the functions of this m.bat file and this r.bat file. So now really all we should need to do in order to both assemble our program, create a .nex file, and run that .nex file in our cspect emulator, all we need to do to do all those three things is execute this make.batch file. So let's go ahead and double click that and we should see our file running in the emulator automatically. And there we go, we have our red border. And if we go back to our folder, you can see we have our project.nex file that was created as well as our project.map file. So now all we have to do when we're developing our program is go ahead and type it into our editor here and let's just try that again. I'll change the color to color number one this time, which is blue, and I'll save this program. So I'll go back to my folder here, and here we have our make.bat file that we can use to uh, assemble our program, create the .nex file, and run it in our emulator. But now let's make our process even easier by using a command window. So let's open a terminal window simply by typing cmd down here in the search bar, and that brings up this command prompt here. And if you right click on it, you can pin it to the taskbar, which I've already done. So I'll just click on this icon to open a command window. So there's my command window. Now this part needs a bit of typing uh, DOS commands. And if you're not familiar with DOS commands, you can uh, omit this part if you want and just run the batch file by clicking on it in Windows. But this part actually makes it a lot quicker, I find. So you can set up a path to find your make.bat file or you can just go to the folder where that file is located, which is what I'm going to do. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm just going to enter CD backslash first of all, which will bring me back to the top level of my C drive, just like that. So you can see I'm in my C drive. And now if I type DIR, that shows me the contents of my C drive. And now I'm looking for that folder where I saved my batch files. And you can see right here, I have a directory called next dev. So I want to go down into that directory. So I do that by typing CD for change directory, then space, and then next dev. And then press enter. And now I'm in the next dev directory. And if I type DIR again for directory, which gives me a listing of everything in the directory, you can see there's another folder here or a directory called project one. So now I want to go into that folder 
And I'll do that the same way, just by typing CD for change directory, space, project one, and enter. And there you go, now I'm in the project one folder. And if I type DIR again, we should see something familiar here, which is here's my m.bat file, here's my make.bat file, and here's my r.bat file. So now if I wanted to execute this make.batch file, all I need to do is type the word make, just like that, and press enter. And that will automatically assemble our program, create the .nex file, and run it in our emulator. So if I press enter here, let's see what happens. There you go. It's run our program in our emulator automatically. And so you might think this is not really easier for us to do by typing in this word, but let me show you how easy it can be when we're actually doing development. So all you need to do is navigate to this folder where these batch files are located in this command window. And that's very simple to do. All we do is use the dir command to list what's in the directory and use the cd command to change our directory. And then once we're in the proper folder here or the proper directory, we can simply type make to execute this make batch file and automatically assemble and run our program. So let's take a look at that again. So now we're back in our editor and we're typing away our program and we're making some modifications. Let's say I change the color here to color number five and then I press control S to save our program. And now I press alt tab to quickly go back to my command window and I type make just like that and press enter and it's automatically running our program now. And now we just need to remember to press escape to exit from this emulator and now alt tab brings me right back to my editor. So I can make another change. Let's say I change the color to zero, press control S to save. And now I press alt tab again to go back to my command window. But now let's make our job even easier. I don't even need to type make this time. I'm just simply going to press the up arrow, which automatically remembers the last command that I entered. And I'll press enter again. And there we go. It ran our program again with our new changes. I'll press escape again to close our emulator. Alt tab to go back to my editor and I'll make a change here. I'll change this to color four and then control S to save. Alt tab to go back to my command window. Up, enter. There's my new color. Escape, alt tab, change it to color six, control S, alt tab, up, enter. There's our new border color. So you see how easy it is to use this development environment now. All we need to do when we want to create a Z80 assembly language program specifically for the ZX Spectrum Next computer and run that program in the emulator, all we need to do is open up our editor. In this case, I'm using the Sublime Text editor. Then we enter our program, save it, and then we can either double click on that make.batch file using the mouse, or we can use a command window like this to quickly go back and forth and execute that make.batch file command using a command window. So however you want to do it, it's up to you. I find it very quick to use this command window and simply press the up arrow and use alt tab to go back and forth between my windows. And it's super easy and it seems to work really well. So this is the starting point that I'm going to be using to create my Z80 assembly language programs now tailored specifically for the ZX Spectrum Next. All right, so there we go. I know it took a long time to go through all those instructions and there were quite a few detailed pieces that we needed to execute and implement. And it took a long time, but if you were able to follow along with all those instructions and you have your development environment set up on your computer now, like I do, I think at least now we have a good starting point that we can use to actually start developing games and programs for the ZX Spectrum Next computer specifically, which is the whole point of this entire journey that I'm taking. The ZX Spectrum Next, as you probably know, is an awesome computer and it has some great features and capabilities and we really want to be able to take advantage of that in our development journey. So now we have a starting point that we can actually do that. So thanks again for following along with me and I really enjoy sharing this information with you because if I'm able to help any of you to develop your own games, I think it's worthwhile because it's kind of tricky to get these development environments set up, at least for me it is. So I'm sure probably for some of you, it's a bit challenging as well. And I'll share with you any updates that I have on my game development journey as well. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.